that's actually going on here. In, uh, verse, in chapter number 1 of Isaiah, verse 4, it says, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger, they are gone away backward. I see this backward used here to say totally counter to what God has done. You know, that's something that every one of us ought to consider when we're uh, raising our children, running our home, even working and growing in the church. Are we doing it the way the Lord has, or are we trying to go about it our own way, which will end up being a backward way if it goes against what God has, uh, is, has ordered in his word. In uh, 1 and 21 of Isaiah there also, it says, how has the faithful city become an harlot? So how did this happen? What happened here to those that were following the Lord? It was full of judgment and righteousness uh, lodged in it, but now murderers. Okay, so it, it used to be right. It used to be good, but something's happened. It's gone backwards, okay? It, it's gone the opposite. My silver has become dross. Dross is what is drawn off of silver. When you heat it, you purify it. The impurities come to the top, and it's drawn off. That's what dross is, and that's exactly what's happened. What is good has been called bad and actually turned bad, okay? It says, thy wine is mixed with water, you know, so there again, it's like, in, in my mind, I'm not a drinker. I hope that none of you are as well, but I think we've all experienced when you go to McDonald's and you get a Coke and you, you drink your Coke and it's a hot day, and then the ice melts in the cup, and then you reach over to your cup later and you take a big drink and it's all that melted water with just a little bit of Coke in it, right? Totally, totally uh, different than what it was originally, um, and, and that's kind of what I think about here. Um, but, but just the total opposite. It says, Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves, which is, again, totally backwards. They should be upright. They should be reputable. They should be role models. But in fact, they have turned and they've uh, been running with the wrong crowd. They're doing crimes. They're being mischievous. Okay? Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. So again, the opposite of charity, the opposite of love, the opposite of what God has ordained. They are selfish. Uh, they said, it says here, and this is important, it says, They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So what we see here is this lack of judgment, lack of good judgment, and not calling out sin when it ought to be called out. And I think that right there is just paramount in when we understand how these things come to be, okay? We've talked with these different heresies as we've led up to this point, ones who have rejected the word of God, uh, they've turned away from what the Bible says, they've, they've gone about their own ways, but when there's not a standard and there's not a man or a man of God or, or a standard being preached, then there is no, no bounds. There is no limitation to what will happen. Everything goes backwards. And so that's what we've seen here in this passage. That's how God has removed his hand from them. The bread, the water, the provision, the guidance. He's taken away even um, a lot of their, their strong leadership. And so that's what we see here. It, it's illustrating oppression by children and leadership by women. And that's exactly what we see in this passage. And the main point that I want to see here is that it is unnatural. And it's not wrong to say that it's unnatural. Okay, it's not orderly, it's not the way it should be, and that's exactly what we're going to look at tonight, is the order of, of biblical leadership and when God is guiding. So here we see in verse 1, the Lord has removed their safety, their provision, their care. This is a time of tribulation, it's a curse, and what else and who else here has been removed? If you look in verse 3, just verses 2 and 3, it says the mighty man, and we're going to come back and we're going to hit on this at the end uh, as good characteristics for you men to have, okay? So be thinking about that as we read through this now. But this is what's been removed here, okay? And, and, and see if it sounds like what people are trying to remove today. It says the mighty man and the man of war. So who is this? The warrior, the, the, the strong man, the one who's going to go out there, the, the one who you can get behind, okay? The judge and the prophet. Again, get rid of the judgment. Get rid of the one who's going to say what's right, the prophet, okay? Get rid of them, okay? This is what God has done here. The judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient. The prudent is the careful one, the one who's going to consider repercussions and, and these types of things, okay? The ancient is the elderly, you know what? We need elderly Christians, amen, in our church, uh, in our society. We need those aged men who have got some miles under their shoes, soles that we can learn from and we can see 
uh, the right way. We need those aged men. And actually what we see laid out in the scriptures here is that the children even revile them. They, they rail on them. They make fun of the older men, right? Totally unnatural. It says in verse 3, the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. This is all for the communication of the, of the gathering, the strength, the unity and the unifying. I remember when the COVID lockdowns happened uh, just a few years ago, we were all affected by that in different ways. And it was very apparent to me early on that with the lockdowns and the restrictions and the mandates, one of the main things they wanted to restrict was people organizing. They didn't want people getting together. They didn't want anybody um, coming together in a, in a grassroots effort. They did that for strength, not for health, okay? They said that it was, you know, so that you don't get people sick. It was to keep people separate, divided, you know, which is exactly what's going on here when there's not the, uh, the, the counselors, the orators, the artificer and the captain of 50, the captains are the ones that are going to kind of get people together and, and take charge, keep it from being chaotic. All these things have been removed. And I'm going to tell you, this is exactly what we're finding in churches and congregations today. And, and I'm not just talking about um, one denomination today or one group of people. I want you to know, though, that these that, that believe these types of things that we're going to talk about, these kind of um, uh, social amendments, if you will, that, that buy into this, it is very, very destructive to God's people, these ones that are brought in. So great harm comes from this. You, you know, we'll talk about some religions today. That's kind of what we've been talking about is some religions, um, but it's, it's very broad. It's very broad. And, and you know, we're going to talk about those who are in the pulpit, those that are actually taking uh, women's leadership right into the pulpit. But even it goes as far down as being even there's women that are in secretarial positions, which you say, well, hey, that's a perfect role for a woman. Uh, well, you know what? Okay, so she's working for another man. But secondarily, the, the uh, secretary, think about this. Who's your first line? Who's answering the phone? Who's talking to all the people? How easy is it for the, um, for the, um, the, the woman that's the, uh, what did I just say? The secretary. My goodness, how did it go? It escaped my mind in one second. How easy is it for the secretary to influence the man of God or the man, right? Because she's the one that, in a sense, controls the information, okay? So that's how broad this is, okay? And if you've not talked to somebody that believes some of these social reforms and these kind of, of um, I, I've used the word amendments, um, but if you've not met somebody like that, which I'm sure you have, pay attention. Pay, pay attention to what the young people are saying. Pay attention to what the young women are saying uh, particularly. Pay attention to the, to the ones who are even wanting to move into a position of church leadership as a woman, knowing, of course, what the Bible says about it. And, and that's where this whole series comes from. We're not just talking about different things that, that disagree with what we want them to say, okay? We're not talking about heresies that disagree with the church. What we're talking about is things that people believe that go against the Word of God. And so that's what we're going to lay out tonight, what the Word of God says. So all these things, all this removal here that God has done in this congregation with this nation equals mass confusion and disorder. So who is ruling? The children and the babes. Now I've heard it said, and I partly believe it, that the reason the women step up and move into leadership is because the men won't do it. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you believe that. I do believe there's probably some truth to it. But I think that what this lays out is that, yes, they had to, but the curse was the children and the woman rising up into leadership. I think that there were still other men there that were not uh, rulers of 50, strong men, men of war. There were other men there, but they weren't, they weren't doing anything. They weren't stepping up, and so the women did. So who is ruling? The children, the babes, the women. The confusion comes, and we see that in verses 5 through 11. We'll hit on this in just one second, but look here, and it says... Uh, as it says in verse 7, it says, In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. We see here that the, uh, the men 
will not step up. They do not want to be the ruler. Everything's in shambles, everything's falling apart, and they say, hey, you know what, I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to take responsibility for this. I don't want to pick up any pieces. I don't want to put in the work. We're going to sit back. And then as you go through, you see in verse 12 and, and, and around there, the children oppression, uh, oppression by the children. You see that the women are left to rule. Um, and as we just laid out in verses 6 and 7, it's, it's the men who are refusing to rule there. And I want you to know that in verse 14, it says the, that the Lord will judge. Okay, so all this being said to say that there is a judgment. There is something else to consider besides what we want. Okay, when we go out and we preach the gospel, we're talking to people about what they believe and what they think a person has to do or if they have ever had any exposure to the scriptures. But at the end of the day, it's all about what lines up with God and his word. That's what everything goes back to. And you know what it all points to is judgment. Judge, a coming judgment, a coming judgment for mankind. Now, we don't need to just focus on this coming judgment of doom and gloom because you know what? We've got a savior, amen? Mm -hmm. We've put our trust in Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to him who's in Christ Jesus, okay? But there is a judgment coming. And that's what we see laid out here. So. What is illustrated here in this passage, what we're talking about tonight is unnatural leadership. And it's unnatural because it goes against God's design and it's backwards. So we're talking about role reversal. We're talking about people doing unnatural jobs, jobs they're not fit for. And I'm not talking about fit by personality or fit by shape or size. We're talking about fit by nature fit by the way you were made, okay? And everybody ought to understand that some things are just made perfect to do a certain thing, right? I'm a mechanic, I work with my hands, I have tools, and you know what they say about the tool? You get the right tool for the job, okay? You don't use the wrong tool to do something. Now, is it gonna get done? You could probably get a wheel off with a hammer, but you know, you'd really be better off using a socket wrench, okay? So there's specific things to do a specific job, and that doesn't mean that we hate the thing that's not fit for the job, Okay, because that's what the attack says. That, that's what we find is that they say, oh, well, if you don't want women to be pastors, it's because you hate women. Goodness sakes, I don't hate women, right? I don't hate the church. I don't love men more than I love women. I don't love my son more than I love my daughter. But you know what? For the job, for the fit, the way God designed it, there's a certain way. And when we do it God's way, it just works. I'm telling you, it just works. We'd all be wise to really just seek out God's direction and go and do it his way so that it works. So the heresies uh, that we're examining, uh, even tonight, go against God's word. They rest the scriptures, they wrestle against the scriptures, and they lead people astray. Examine today the trickery behind modern day role reversals in the home and in the church. And this is something that you can think on. I'm not going to lay out any specific examples. I know even tonight I've heard testimony of ones who have fallen into this trap. Okay, you have talked to these, these ones. You have heard sermons about, for and against this topic. Okay, there's lots out there. So just examine it and examine the trickery. Okay, now this is Mother's Day weekend. And I think it's very appropriate to preach a message such as this on Mother's Day weekend. And you know what I especially have taken notice of, you know, not just in light of this sermon, but just in general, is I've noticed, and I've talked about it many times, the advertisements that come across social media to invite you to local churches. Have you guys, have your phones just been overrun by these ads like mine has? Uh, you can't scroll far at all on any social media platform without being inundated by these Newer churches, big churches, mega churches, putting out their promotional videos, talking about their enticements and their invitations, how they want you to come and be a part of something exciting, and there's something geared specially for you. You've heard the language. So right now, Mother's Day, I mean, and here's the thing, they've gone from one to the next, right? It was Christmas, it was Easter, it was, you know, one to the next. It's promo video, promo video, promo video. Well, it's Mother's Day, and you know who I see that they're, that they're, I'll say reaching out to. I think it's more like pandering to or catering to, but they're reaching out, okay, to stressed out, overworked, heavy laden moms. Have you seen this? I mean, they, they're really like wanting to like tug on the heartstrings of the mom who's doing it all you know, and, and they want to offer her something that she needs, right? They're bribing them with flowers, 
I mean a flower bar. There's a church that's got a flower. I've never even heard of a flower bar, but apparently you go to a flower bar, I guess like a salad bar, and you pick out your own bouquet, and hey, mom, it's for you. You get a, you get a flower bouquet, okay? So they've got flower bars, they've got donuts, they've got big breakfasts, they've got books that they're handing out, they've got uplifting sermons geared to refresh you is exactly what they're promoting, okay? You know what? I think, I think this is a sermon that is geared towards uplifting women, amen? Mm-hmm. This is edifying the whole body, not just the women, but the whole body. This is what God says right here. And so this is uplifting. This ought to be refreshing. Here's what I say to them. Let the women be women and let the men be men, right? That's how God orchestrated it. That's how God created us to be. And that's the way that it works best. And so it's funny sometimes, I don't remember the name of it, but there is a a specific name for when you're uh, analyzing a situation or a problem, and uh, the the simplest answer is usually the right one. You know, I feel like that's how it is with the Word of God sometimes. It's like the, 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 the shortest answer that you come to first is usually the right one. And you know what? Letting women be women and letting men be men as they were created, to me, is just the simplest most direct answer, and you know what? It's the right one. So let's look at this for just a minute. I do want to look at God's instructions for mankind. You know, I'm not just going to stand up here and rail on, uh, on all these other people and how they're doing it wrong. Let's actually lay out what the Bible says, because that's, that's what our standard is. This, this is what we come from. So if you look in Genesis chapter 2, all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, This, of course, is the creation of of woman right here, okay? Genesis chapter 2. I don't want to burn up a lot of time with reading tonight. I'm I'm very mindful of our time. I want to be respectful of your time here. But this is all so good, okay? So we are going to do a lot of reading tonight. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we'll read through the end of the chapter. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to thy sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, which... Uh, that is which compasseth the whole land of Hula, where gold is. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bdellium and onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that uh, compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hydekel, which is it which goeth toward east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. So here's where we come across the thing that is not good in all of God's creation. Okay, The fact that man is alone, which to me is interesting to see that he's got God, he's got the creation, he's got all these things, yet you know what, he's lonely. And I think maybe that just resonates with me as a human man, the need for companionship. It's wired into us, okay? We have a need, a desire to have companionship, okay? So it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So Adam's busy. He's not sitting around with nothing to do, okay? He's not just twiddling his thumbs, wishing that he had somebody to kick rocks with here, okay? He's got a lot to do. It says, And the Lord God caused... Um, in verse 20, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found to help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. 
and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now for our coloring sheet there for the kids, we've got a picture of the husband and the wife that are standing there in unity. They're not naked, they have clothes on, okay? But it, the illustration here is very simple. Man and woman together, okay? Created together from one and standing in unity together. And I'm not gonna preach on divorce tonight, uh, but just to say that this unity this two put together in one is for a lifetime. It's forever. You don't separate what has been put together. So uh, that's another sermon for another time. But that's the illustration, okay, kids? That's what the verse is right there, okay? It's, it's man and woman. They're leaving their father and mother. They're becoming one, okay? Very, very good, very healthy. It's something that all of our children need to not just be told that that's what they're going to do, but they need to be instructed on why that's important. Why is it that Christians today uh, send their kids off to college and then wonder why they fall away from God? Wonder why they fall away from church? Well, they're throwing them out there to the wolves, but they never taught them why, okay? So they just run off, and then, and then that's what they do. In Matthew chapter 19, we see the same passage here in Matthew chapter 19. I want, I want us to see the normalcy of this, okay? The, the natural tendency here. In Matthew chapter 19, 1 through 12, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came unto the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he, held them, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. I hope you saw that we saw that we read that from the very beginning. Okay? The commandment that that is, and the commandments that come from that passage, which we'll see in just a little bit, it's not man's words. It's not my words, and it's not just what the Bible says. It's the command from, from God, okay? It's the way God laid it out. It's, it's, it's what, how God established it from the beginning, okay? They twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So what we see here is the natural, normal, preferred uh, status of man, which is married, he's in unity, he is connected to a helpmeet. And, you know, I'm not going to take time to really break down what that is today, but I'll just tell you this, we need each other. Amen. Husbands, we need our wives. And, and wives, you need your husbands. I think that's very evident, okay? And uh, like I said, we, we can get into that. That's a really great study. But just know that. That's why God created it that way, okay? In verse 10, what do we see here? It says, His disciples said unto him, if the, if the case of the man be so with his wife... It is not good to marry. Isn't that just like a human, just to take it to the very uh, extent, you know, just to the farthest edge? You know what I mean? Be like, well, if that's the case, then, you know, I just won't marry. Or, you know, we just want to go totally to extremes. But what do we say here? If that's the case, the man would say, I'll just be single. Well, the Bible addresses that also. In verse 11, what does it say? But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, there are some who can and will stay single. Paul, in fact, challenges. You know, he charges that some should be like him. He would, he would say that that's, uh, that's okay, right? But not all. In fact, I would say the minority can do that, can succumb to that. Okay, can, can, can live out that type of, uh, of life. We are to be joined together. That is natural. Um, 1 Corinthians um, 7 is where Paul illustrates these, um, uh, these roles very clearly. We can look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 and 2. 
What does it say? Now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Marriage is the, um, is the remedy for fornication. It's right to be married in God's eyes. Okay, it's not a loophole. It's not uh, some, you know, fine print. You know, it's right. It's good. It, it's, it's okay. It's wholesome to do that. And what is not okay is fornication. What is not okay is to go against what God says. In uh, chapter 6, we see charges there to flee fornication and not be joined to a harlot in verse 16. So the joining together should be done in righteousness and with what God says. You can't just uh, see that God says we shouldn't be alone and so I'm just going to go be with a harlot. I'm just going to go spend time with whoever I want to spend time with. No, there's still a right way to do it. There's still God's way that's laid out, okay? So fornication is not uh, right. Fornication is what should be avoided. The cure for that is marriage, okay? The avoidance of that and not to go and, and just to be joined to harlots or to go and, and do our own thing. Uh, we see that. In verses 3 and 4 here, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, it says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So what we see here is that this, this illustrates the two becoming one. Because it would be just like man to say, well, you know what then? If two uh, becomes one, then, then I'm the primary, I'm the leader, and what I say goes. Now, while there is a, uh, a, a level of leadership in the home, which is what we're going to get into today, it's not always uh, that the man just overrides and overrules and overruns and just uh, totally uh, you know, uh, doesn't consider at all his help me, right? We should both consider, and it's good for us to know that, you know what? Your body is not your own. And that's actually quite literal, because as you see here, laying out, it goes on, and it, and it lays this out. <clears throat> what does it say in verse 5? Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give to yourselves to fasting and to prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not, for your incontinency. So what do you see here? We see here, you know what? Don't play games. And married couples, you understand this. You know what this is talking about here. Don't play games. Don't, don't be playing dramatics. Don't be, you know, trying to claim possession of, of your own body and hold it over the other one, okay? Because what's going to happen here? It says, now for, for a time, is that acceptable? That is. For a time of, of fasting, for a time of prayer, you know, there's certain times where it's absolutely permitted to be separate, okay? But for manipulation, it's not. And here's what happens from the separation is when the, when the Satan can come in and take advantage. This is a key way that Satan gets advantage of men, okay? I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about here, but be mindful of that, okay? Now, what's the cure? God's way. God's way. That, that's what this lays out here. There, there is a right way. And that's what is laid out here. So what do we see here? We're going to focus rather on these roles. I don't want to get too specific on any of these one point, these, these each points here, uh, particular points. But what do we see here is two becoming one. Okay, so that gives, we see here, equal value, equal worth, equal care, equal provision. Okay, all these things are equal, but with different rules. So some might say, well, then how can you say that if two have become one, then how is women, women ruling? How is that unnatural? If you look in 1 Peter chapter 3, this is some duties here. So we'll go through this. We are familiar with these passages. I know we are. 1 Peter chapter 3. But I, I, there's a lot of people, believe me, that do not understand this. There's people in churches that do not understand this. Okay, there's there's pastors that flat out overlook this. All right. Now, this isn't normally the conversation that we get into at the door, but I'm going to tell you people ask these types of questions. 
okay? And, and our ladies who are out here with long hair and with long dresses that go out soul winning, they get asked these kind of questions. And assumptions are made about our families because we homeschool our kids, okay? So what, should we know what the Bible says? We should know what the Bible says. In 1 Peter chapter 3, let's look here, just 1 through 6. Very quickly, we'll read through this here. And, and again, you understand this, but let, let's read this out. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that with outward adorning, a plaiting of hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So just first of all, to lay out, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the inside. How beautiful is the heart of a Christian woman, okay? Beauty, beautiful on the inside, pleasing to God, and I'm going to tell you pleasing to man also, all right? Forget the broided hair, forget the gold apparel, forget all the outward uh, signs of beauty, it's the heart. It's very beautiful. That's how God created you. That's how God created men, okay? It says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So some different things that we see here. This, this is the charge to the women. They are to be submissive. Uh, they are to be good witnesses. In Titus, back a few pages here, in Titus... In Titus chapter 2, you're all there. I don't even know where it is. Thank you, help me, for offering up your Bible, but I cannot read that fine print. I can't read my fine print. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> All right, you know what? We're going to keep going because I'm going to get right back into verse 7 here of First Peter, which is gone now. But we're, what we're going to get into, but what does it lay out? It talks about the roles of the wives. It talks about the subjection. It talks about the placement. It talks about the things that we do specifically and that ladies are held to. Okay? And it's right. And the word of the Lord is not blasphemed, right, when these things are preached. What, what is it that blasphemes the Lord? What is it that goes against the scripture? What is it that throws the word of God in the trash? It's when people go against his word. It's when we decide that we're going to do it better ourselves. When we are going to take and say, you know what, I know what the word of God says, but I'm going to throw it out. Okay, I know that the word of God says that I should raise my daughter to be a certain way. All right, that there's certain standards that we need to hold to. There's certain characteristics that we need to teach. There's certain traits that she needs to have. But you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to overlook that. I'm going to overlook what the Bible says. I'm going to overlook what God says because I'm going to do it a better way. I don't want people to think that we're weird. I don't want to not send, you know, my girl to college because everybody's going to think we're weird. I don't want her to, you know, whatever the, the particulars are, when we throw the word of God out, when we overlook it, it it's, it's, uh, it's frustrated. It's, it's blasphemed. It's thrown away. It's turned to garbage. And that's not what we're supposed to do. So there's submission. There's being a good witness. There's instructions for older women and for younger women. All these types of things are important. Verse 7, back in uh, uh, 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 7, says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. And we're going to break this down just a little bit. I want to know what that looks like uh, for the husbands to dwell with them according to knowledge. And in fact, I've, I've, I've seen this illustrated just reading through here in three different ways. Three ways that we can apply this dwelling according to knowledge here. And I think it's wise that we understand this, men. Uh, we need to understand uh, how, how our wives work, 
We need to understand how they're created different than us. And I think it's interesting here that we can uh, dwell with them according to knowledge because men are logical. I mean, that's the way it is, and I hope that you've seen that, and you, you can see some illustration in that in your own lives. Women tend to be emotionally driven, emotionally compelled, tied emotionally to their family, to the decisions they make. Um, it's, it's actually perfectly created this way. And then, how do we see men created? You know what? We're not as emotional as women are. And I'm not talking about crying at a sad movie or uh, something about having kids. Men, it really makes us cry a lot more than we did when we were younger, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in decision making, okay? And so, for the Bible to lay out here that we can uh, uh, dwell with our wives according to knowledge, I think is very clear. So what does it say? We'll just read verse 7, and then I want to break this down a little bit. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So what do I see here? First of all, I see that this isn't just saying not only to a charge, uh, not only a charge to be knowledgeable, but we are more logical. And so the illustrations of the woman's heart, the beauty being in the woman's heart, I think is very clear. When we read our passage in Isaiah chapter 3, I saw a lot of with the characteristics of the men and the men that were removed, which led to chaos. It was a lot of the um, organization. It was a lot of the logic that was gone. What came from that? All the confusion, okay? So... Women uh, are beautiful in their hearts. They're led by their hearts. They're tied to things by their hearts. How often do you have a conversation with your wife about what she feels, right? And now this can be hard for men to understand sometimes because we don't feel the same way, right? Uh, use our jobs, for example. Men, it's not a problem for us to uh, work late, okay? To, uh, to choose work over uh, our family, to choose work over dinner time, to choose work over a family function, okay? Uh, one illustration, my brother is a busy guy, he's young, you know, we're in our 30s or, or early 40s, and so he's busy working on all this stuff. Well, he, he couldn't care less to come to family functions. Who is it that's upset by that? Mom's upset by that, right? And it's, you know, kind of just a clear illustration how, you know, men can easily overlook these types of things that are very important to the women and they're, and they're connected to that by their heart, okay? Which, as I've been saying here, and I hope I can illustrate, that's a good thing, okay? That's the way that we are designed. It's not uh, greater or lesser uh, for the whole. In fact, uh, the, the, the advantage is being together. One of each part is the advantage, okay? So women are emotional, and you know what? There's some, uh, there's just, there's many obvious differences here, um, and what it does illustrate is just that we're not created the same. We are created differently, okay? That's what many of these illustrations lay out, is that we are created differently. The second thing here I see, talking about uh, dwelling with knowledge, is to be knowledgeable. Now, here's the thing, men. You are accountable for a wife that is in subjection to you, okay? That's a pretty heavy-duty responsibility. Now, you think about the pastor of a church, and one thing that a pastor of a church will say, or a man in leadership of a church, is probably the same thing like what a man in the leadership of a business or a CEO would say. He says it's a great responsibility to have all these things hanging on your shoulders, right? To have all these ones looking at your leadership that are going along with your decisions, Men, this is the same for us in our home, right? This is the man that we need to be. We need to be knowledgeable, and we need to know that we are accountable for a wife who is in subjection to us. So let me say also, men, be a man that the woman can submit to. See, the whole point to being created this way is that we have a preference, and women want to have a man that they can submit to, okay? And so when men like such as we are seeing out in the world today, who are weak and, and wimpy, and they're not decisive, they're not making decisions, they're afraid of everything, okay? This is not a, a man that a woman's going to be attracted to, a woman from her heart, right? Now, now is he going to find a wife? He might, he might find some woman who wants to mother him for the rest of his life, but that's not natural. What's natural is that he would be a man that a woman can submit to. Right? So men, think about this. Be this type of man. Be decisive. Be strong. Be logical. And uh, the different traits that you have, 
strengthen her. Okay, and, and I want to tell you, this isn't just personality. I mentioned that once already, but we're not talking about the different personalities that people have and what clicks. We're talking about the way that we were created differently that work together properly, okay? And so it, that's, that's underlying, you know, under personality, right? And by the way, you definitely need to, to have a spouse that your personalities match, you know, that you can get along with. Uh, intellectual wise, there's different connections that are to be made. So there's different things here. But what we're talking about is, is how we were created. Uh, there's an old saying. Uh, I, people don't say it so much anymore, not that I'm um, exposed to. But you've heard the, the term that people go and they get hitched, right? Or they're hitched. Well, man, she's hitched to you, right? You are the one that she is hitched to. Her wagon is connected to you. Where you go, you're taking, taking her with you, okay? Think about that. Thirdly, I want to think about giving her honor. It says, we have to think about giving our wives honor, okay? Uh, I'm sure that every married couple has had the conversation where they'd say, you know, he, I just feel like he doesn't get me, or I feel like he doesn't love me, or I feel like he doesn't do this, right? Well, and he's thinking to himself, well, you know, I told her I loved her on the day we got married, and I'm a man of my word, so what more does she want from me, you know? I mean, I told her once, and I'm, and I'm honest, right? Well, we got to think about being continual in that regard, okay? Uh, women are feeling it every day, and men, we don't think like that. We don't feel like that. So we need to, logically, we need to know how to take care of our wives and to give her honor. What does that say? I mean, Mother's Day is coming up. But let me just tell you, don't count on Mother's Day to be the day that you show her honor, okay? Like, if it weren't for Mother's Day, I'd really be in hot water. I mean, forget Mother's Day. This should be normal. This should be the normal thing that we do. We should be con constantly thinking about this, okay? So, <clears throat> so what do we see here? Think about how we do it. Now, man, we can go to work, and with our coworkers, we bully them into keeping up, don't we? We've got a camaraderie. We can, we can bust each other's chops. We can uh, you know, go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You know, we can get competitive with our work and what we're doing. You know, I think about construction workers or you know, just the, the jobs that men have where we're just in competition. You can't compete with your wife. Don't compete with your wife. Okay, we're not competitive. We're not on the same level. We're not of the same strengths. And you can't have that type of a relationship with her. Don't squash her accomplishments or browbeat her contribution. It's different than what you could do. But you know what? It's needful that it's different than what you could do. All right, two men living together is not natural on several different levels. But you know what? The reason that a man and a woman is Natural, it's more than just biology. It's the things that we bring to the table. It's the two sides of what we are. It's how we were created with logic and, and feelings and, and heart, and, and it's separate. And so when you squash her accomplishments or you browbeat her contribution, don't be surprised when you're tempted by Satan if you get the reference, okay? It's not right that that would happen, but don't be surprised, okay? Give her the honor as the weaker vessel. You know what? Know that she's a weaker vessel. And give her honor as the weaker vessel. And isn't it funny? This is the point that the modern feminists, the role reversals, can't understand. They will never understand having honor as a weaker vessel. Because what do they say? The feminists, they want it equal. They want it all equal, all straight across the board. You know what? God's, God's rule says that it's not straight across the board and that we need to give honor with her as the weaker vessel. So, you know, this is the point of these, and we're gonna expound more on that in just a minute, but there's some good advice here. Verse seven continues, and it says that your prayers be not hindered. If you look back in James four, and I, I'm just, I, I do wanna kind of take this out of context a little bit. We're talking about the brethren. We're talking about relationships here, but just pay attention to what it says here in one through four of, of uh, James four, back just a couple pages. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that you war in your members? You lust and you have not, you kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it 
upon your lusts. In verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an is enemy with God. What do we see here? First of all, I mean, just think about this. Fightings between you, lusts between you, uh, ask and receive not, consume it for lust, you know, these types of things. Now, again, I know I've taken this out of context, you know, and, and applying it more locally uh, than, it, than it is intended, but I just can't help but see a bit of a comparison on a personal level, guys, of, of what it is that causes God to do certain things and the relationship that we have with him and uh, some of the variables that affect the relationship that we have from him, right? We walk around wondering, man, I've been praying about this forever. Is God not hearing me? You know, I'm not getting any direction on this. I'm not getting any help on this, you know? Yet we still walk around in our own covetousness, in our own anger, in our own uh, ways, with our own lust, you know, praying for, for these types of things that are going to make us feel better. Do we think about the relationship that we have? Do we think about the needs of our woman? Do we think about the way that we honor our wife as the weaker vessel? Why? That our prayers be not hindered? That's very interesting. Back to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Be compassionate. Uh, this is be sympathetic. Guys, this goes a long way. Men and ladies, this goes a long way and this doesn't just mean feel sorry for them we're not talking about feeling sorry for them because they're a woman feeling sorry for them because they can't move bricks like we can move bricks that's that's not what this is talking about this is talking about compassion okay be compassionate don't be selfish um, there's more application to the natural design if we look um, you know what for, for time's sake I think we'll we'll overlook it but in Ephesians chapter 5 we see the comparisons here between husbands and wives, uh, which is as to Christ and the church. Uh, the church is subject to Christ, and we don't ever scoff at that, do we? We don't ever say that God ought to listen to us because we're the church, okay? That God ought to know that we've got 40 members and there's only one of him, or 11, depending on who you listen to, or nine, I think it was, uh, Pentecostals, Charismatics, but anyway, you know, we, we, we are, can outnumber him, so he needs to listen to us. No, that's not the case. That's laughable if we were to say that about the church, but you know what? In, in the same sense of our homes, you know, that is the way that the, that the rules um, are outlined, that the authority is in the home, and you know what? The husbands do have rule um, over the wives. The wives and the children are subject unto the husband. And again, I'm just going to say, this isn't problematic, this is normal, this is honorable, and this is ordained by God. So those who understand it can really know how this works. And, you know, to be frank, those that are on the outside looking in, it may seem awkward. It may seem weird. And, you know what, they just won't get it. I believe that there are safe people who just don't get it. They'll just, they'll never get it. And it's because they haven't been taught, they haven't been instructed, they haven't been shown from the Word of God. And, you know... They just need to know. They need to know. In uh, chapter 6, verse 1, we'll not read that, but here in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what's it say? It says, um, I'm talking about the children, uh, how the children are in subjection. And, um, you know, that's another point for another sermon, but it's an obvious illustration to the natural function and design of God, that the children are not in charge. And what did we find back there in Isaiah chapter 3? The, the children were in charge. The children were raising up. Children ruling is destructive. Homes today, people's homes today, have children ruling their homes. And you know what? It's destructive. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm out in the world enough, you know, with my job and going to the grocery store and the places that we go, the things that we see. You can see when children rule the house, can't you? You can see when the kid throws the fit and then the parents just cave, you know. Uh, they've got these implacable children with no bounds and no, you know, they, they, they've got no boundaries, they've got no instruction, and the parents just following them around, you know, just, just taking care of them like this. It's unnatural, it's destructive. But that's besides the point for tonight. Let's get back to the point of tonight's sermon, which is the destruction caused by role reversalists and specifically feminists in the church. Feminism is creeping into good churches at an alarming rate, and it has already destroyed other heretical denominations. You've seen this, the, the, the information's out there, the, the facts and the data are out there. Some of the most overrun denominations that we run into 
are the Methodists and the Lutherans. And so I'm just going to read just a couple of clips out of an article that was on CNN from 2018 with such headlines. You know, it's the same article that's out there on different websites, but, you know, with digital headlines and news media. These headlines today talk about how women are striving for church leadership. And I think that's interesting that a woman can go to Bible college and learn the Bible, allegedly, supposedly, okay, see what the Bible says, come out of Bible college as a theologian and not see the issue, not see how contrary it is. I think that that's just mind-boggling to me. Now, in these denominations, I think that there are some saved, and I think what's interesting is that actually, it seems to me, and, and I may be wrong on this point just in my recollection of it, but it seems like we do actually run into some saved Lutheran believers. And it seems to me maybe the older Lutheran, not the younger ones. Uh, some saved, which is kind of interesting because there's so many wrong distinctives there that include infant baptism, uh, different liturgical practices, uh, the sacramental Catholic teachings, the Eucharist, you know, some different things. They don't usually trust that the Bible is inerrant word of God and that it can be stood on. You know, they've got their fathers and their heritage and these things that they lean on. So I think it's kind of surprising. But nonetheless, we do run into some that are saved. But here's what's going on in these churches. And these figures are admittedly a couple of years old. But in 2022, some figures here for you. And maybe, like I said, these are, these are internet you know, sources, but I have witnessed, you know, these types of things. So take that for what it's worth. In 2022, some, some figures here say that Evangelical Lutheran Churches of America reports that there are 4 million members in the United States. And of their 4 million membership in the United States, 40% of the pastors are women. 40 per, this is their figures from their author in their article. 40% says 46% of all bishop positions are held by women, and 54% of associate or assistant pastor positions are held by women. Now, you, you might say, well, the, the math doesn't quite add up. The fact that this says 54% of associate or assistant pastors are women is accurate, I believe, which leaves 22% to be the senior pastors. So you say, that really seems like a lot of women pastors in there. Notice the assistant pastorate. Notice the, uh, the, the pastor team dynamic that there is to where these women are taking the role of the assistant pastor or, or the other pastor. Okay, this is what's coming in. Uh, there's a 2018 report. Um, I've got the lady's name here, Eileen Campbell Reed, who's, who's in, a, in an article, states that U.S. clergy who are women rose from 2.3% in 1960 to 20.7% in 2016. So that's a huge influx um, of women in what they call is the clergy, you know, in leadership positions, in ordained positions. Um, what we find, and, and you have run into this, I, I venture to say, most mainline denominations have seen their proportion of clergy women rise in multiples since the early 1990s. Okay, so it's not that it was just, you know, the gradual over time between the 60s to today. It's that there's these times when it really took a sharp incline, an increase, and that's exactly what we found in our lifetime you guys like in recent years like it's one thing to be able to like blame you know the guys 200 years ago but here's what we're talking about like in our lifetime this is what's been happening now in some denominations like the unitarian universalist and the united church of christ you know that the number of women has pulled even with the men and that's no surprise we know enough about those heretical congregations to not even be surprised as one of my brothers says man I'm not surprised with anything that they do but th these figures here don't uh, th they don't baffle us uh, we believe it to be true of course women in ministry isn't enough and this is what I find almost most laughable about their position on this if it were just that you know women ought to be in leadership that's that's one thing you know women women can lead women are rational you know anyway I'm not gonna say you know the things that they might argue because I disagree with the things with the points that they would make but here's the thing 
women in ministry isn't enough, they still face lower pay, less opportunities, and inconsistent support in areas like maternity leave. So it's not even good enough that they're like the pastors of the church. There's all these other things that it encompasses. And you know, this is exactly the way it is in the workplaces, in corporate America, in politics, and all these types of things. It's all the same. It's all the same fighters. It's all the same deception. And it's in the churches. The main point of the article is this. It says, and I'm going to quote this right here. It says, having women in roles of power can help amend church structures that are inhospitable to underrepresented people and clear wider paths for acceptance and empowerment among communities. Church, I have read about a wide gate and a broad way. And you know what? I don't think it needs help getting any wider and any broader. Amen? It's already the way of destruction. So here's what they're doing. They're amending church structures. You know what that means to amend something? It's just like what we find with laws or in the Constitution amendments. It's making little changes to make it fairer. To make it more fair. It's because some people are oppressed, it says. And you know what? Some people would argue it just brings it up to date. It just takes this outdated thing and it brings it up to modern times. You know what? When you're going to the Word of God, there is nothing here that needs updating. There is nothing here that needs brought, you know, brought up to the 21st century. There's nothing here that doesn't apply, uh, that we need to rework. There's nothing here that needs amended. There's nothing here that, that uh, needs any of our help to do anything. Amen. We just need to apply it. All right. So modern church advertisements, of course, I've already talked about this, but they promote the women in the front and the man submissive. Right. And I'm not just talking about positionally. You know what? If I'm going to take a picture with my wife, I'm going to put her in front because she's the prettier one of the two of us. OK, so what I'm talking about is you can see it in the authority. You can see it in the presence. You can see that these men are are behind their wives in many different facets of the relationship and in the, uh, the power dynamic there. Churches today have husband and wife teams, not, not a husband and wife like a pastor and his wife, but like two pastors, okay, the husband and the wife, which is just crazy. I've heard about churches that have splits. I've heard about, there's one church by our house that the two pastors were going through a divorce and the congregation was divided and every week it was drama. And I'm thinking to myself, who is still going to that church when they're going through a divorce? What? How does that work? But you know what? I wouldn't have gone there in the first place, and neither should anybody else that reads their Bible. But, you know, that, this is what's going on in the, in the non-denominational churches out here that are sprouting up like crazy that are going on out there. This is exactly what's going on in there. This is what you're going to find is these these husband and wife pastor at teams and just women in leadership in general. Uh, the advertisements, of course, like I already talked about briefly, appeal to the women and to the children because women and children run the homes today. Uh, it is true. Men work outside the home and women work inside the home. There are plenty of areas inside the home where women have authority, where they have their need, where they can exercise their, their uh, strengths. Um, there's decisions that my wife makes inside the home that I back up, that I confer her on. You know, it's natural, it's right. I work outside the home. Uh, she, I talk about my own family, but you know, it's biblical. It works inside the home. But what's going on here is that these churches pander to the moms and they pull them with emotional enticements, knowing that they are the ones that are making the decisions in the house. They're the ones that are running the books. They're the ones that are deciding where we're gonna go. They're the ones that are deciding uh, all these different things. Uh, they're, they're reaching out also to the single women, which are encouraged to be single women, okay? They're single mom households, which are encouraged to be single mom households. Uh, they're reaching out to women dominant households, never hearing any preaching about what God how God orchestrated the relationship, um, just being encouraged. Uh, but what do we say that? Um, and I'm not even going to mention the Methodist and all their shenanigans with their rainbow flags and stuff. But here's the other issue, too, that I want to bring into this series, you know, talking about the heresies in America. They don't read the Bible, and that's very obvious. So what are they reading? What do these people have to talk about week after week after week standing in the pulpits? What can they do for counsel? What advice can they give somebody who is struggling with these 
temptations and tribulations that we face in the world, what advice can they give them? Where do they get it from? They get it from the books that they uh, recommend to people that are written by, I would say, man, but they're written by women, okay? They're, they're, they're compiled and they're put out there in such a way that it's to make money is what it's for. And the things that they talk about, and goodness sakes, go to a Christian bookstore and back up what I'm telling you. You know, you've seen it. Go walk through those aisles where the King James section has been reduced to a half a bookcase and the whole store is full of self-help. And what is it? It's women empowerment and women's spirituality and how to forgive and how to balance your life because you're juggling everything as a woman, right? You've got the corporate world, you've got your family, you've got your deadbeat husband and your kids that won't leave the house that you've got you've to gotta balance. So, of course, they're going to sell you books on how to do that. And, oh, knowing God's will for you, isn't that something they're always talking about is what's God's will for you? Well, we already saw here what God's will was. We already saw here the natural position and even how to get your prayers heard by, by going along with what, uh, with what God says. But, you know, don't ever talk about that. We're going to sell you a book. We've got something else to give you. These things that they read, they're barely a devotional. You know, I wouldn't even call them a devotional. There's no scripture in them whatsoever. Women dominant households are exactly what gender equality produces. Okay, the gender equality is not producing even, you know, rural houses that are well balanced. They are making women dominant households, and women dominancy destroys men. It destroys men. Okay, it's not like, well, you know, it works for you, or, or no, it's, it's destructive because we're created a certain way. That's how we're created. For time's sake, I'm just going to go over. Uh, you know, some of these verses here, but I want to remind you that back in Isaiah chapter 3, men, verses 2 through 7, were the men that God had withdrawn or withheld from the uh, nation. And it's what brought in all the trouble, okay? And it was the list of men, the, the eloquent speakers, the leaders, the rulers of 50 uh, men. Read those. Think about those. Think about if there are characteristics and traits that you can have in your life as a man. And that if that's something that's um, relevant in your household, if it's something that applies to your household, if it's something that needs strengthened in your household, just, just think about that. Um, as I read that, guys, I'm encouraging you because as I read that, I recognized that there was you know, good fatherly and good husband traits there, okay? What happens is uh, what's left when the women uh, take over, the men reject uh, leadership. They don't even want the leadership because it's such a mess. If women want to not be overworked, stressed out, stripped down, let the men be men. And go back and read in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. How many women do I know that are of that description? Okay, and go back and read it and, and think about it. I'm not trying to take anything out of context. I'm not trying to be a comedian up here. Okay, but you can go through and you can read that. And it's no wonder that women end up the way they are and where they do when they have rejected men, they've rejected God, they say, I can do it my way, myself, I don't need any help, and they end up alone and bald and with no children and having to make these, you know, life decisions on their own with no help from anybody. It's no wonder. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you that the conversation that you'll find in this church is happy wives. Okay, and happy husbands. That's the conversations that you'll hear. Those are the types of relationships that you'll find in this church. Okay, and that's not like that in every church. Now, <clears throat> I haven't had long conversations with all you women. Okay, and I don't talk to my wife about all the conversations she has with all you women because, once again, I'm not really that worried about all that stuff. You know, it's, we're on a different level here. Okay, but here's the thing what are the women talking about? They're talking about their kids, right? They're talking lovingly about their husbands. They're praising their families. They're talking about having thanksgiving and being thankful to God for what he's done and what he's blessed them with. How about the men? The men are talking about how their wives are good teachers to their children. How we want to have more children with our wives because our homes are happy and our wives are doing a good job and our children are a blessing to us, okay? Uh, we talk about how they're wonderful homemakers. Um, we're not we're not complaining we're not nagging I'm gonna tell you what we're not suspicious of our wives 
Oh, I'm going to tell you, you go out there in the world, you talk to men about their wives, and you'll find all kinds of accusations, all kinds of surmisings, all kinds of, of doubts and, and wonderings what's going on, okay? Their work relationships bring in suspicion. Their, their uh, worldly relationships bring in suspicion, okay? Worldly hobbies bring in suspicion. Guys, it's horrible what's going on out there. And, and I'll tell you, I've had worldly conversations with people or conversations with worldly people in my workplace, for example. A uh, mechanic shop can turn into a barber shop sometimes. And you wouldn't believe how vulgar these men are talking about their kids and their wives. It's disgusting. I've gotten up and walked away from people having a daughter and hearing what these guys, the names they call their daughters, I will not repeat because they're, they should not be uttered in families, but especially in church. It's disgusting what these men say about their families. And it's no different with, with the women. I, I've got kid, uh, adults that understand that their kids are pretty much useless as young adults. They can't do anything for themselves. Um, they can't hold down a job. They can't pay for anything. They're deadbeats. Uh, this is their words, by the way. And, uh, you know, I don't agree with them or console them or anything. I'm just all ears at that point thinking, man, oh, man, <laughs> that's not how I'm raising my kids. Amen? I mean, I teach my kids how to be men and ladies, okay? This, this is what we do. So, you know, goodness sakes, the world doesn't understand what's going on. But uh, here's why we bring this up in the series is because this is happening out there, and it's happening in churches, and churches are going against the world. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see laid out exact roles for the man and for the deacon, the, the, the bishop and the deacon, okay, and their wives also. It's here. Uh, the man desired the office of a bishop. If, if uh, a man not know how to rule his own house, these types of things. You can go through and you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34, that talk about how women are to be kept in the church, okay? That goes against how these women are acting in the church. That goes against the roles that these women are stepping into as leaders and preachers, okay? Going on through uh, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35. And it says, you know, how that they should be, um, how that they should ask their husbands at home, you know, if, they're, if there's something that needs clarification or when they're learning these things, ask their husbands at home. You know, that right there, very clear, excludes women pastors. Um, the deal here is it's an unnatural role and it's a role reversal and it's backwards. That's what we saw at the very beginning in Isaiah chapter 1 is that it was backwards. That's exactly what's happening uh, today is that these teachings are backwards. And you know what, church? We encourage what is right in the Lord. Not just on this topic or this subject, but we always stand on what's right. We have a standard, which is the Bible, okay? And we are to read the Bible, understand the Bible, and preach the Bible as our standard. It's what we stand on, okay? Our children in here that are listening to this, our teenagers, our young adults, our kids need to know why we behave the way we do. Don't just tell your kids what to do. Tell them why we do it. Don't let them leave your house and then fall into this perverted teaching out here that goes against God's word. And when we teach them why we do the things that we do, then they will understand. Show them from the Bible. Have them memorize these passages. Take them soul winning where they hear these conversations. Also know that our boys and our girls have expectations. We are not raising children, we're raising adults. They're only children for this much time. After that, they have a lifetime ahead of them of being an adult. Equip them for being an adult, okay? So we have expectations for them. We expect our, our girls to grow up and be wonderful women. We expect our boys to grow up and be wonderful men, strong men, okay? <clears throat> we encounter young people who question our teaching and they assume that we're backwards, right? Ladies who go out soul winning, you go to the grocery store, um, you know, people look at us funny, you know? People, uh, our women are noticed by their long hair and their dresses. Our children are held in derision. They're mocked for being homeschooled. You've heard the jokes, right? We encounter this role reversal on many fronts in our Christianity, and the Bible is very clear. We don't tell our kids what to do. We teach them what the Bible says. I'm sorry if I went long-winded on the, these points here. Um, I have more scripture to get into, but um, anyway, let's pray, and then uh, we'll continue on. God in heaven, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. That, that's, God, that's what I'm thankful for so, so often. It's my salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the word that we have that we can follow. I just ask that uh, this church 
uh, has your, your guidance and your blessings. Pray that we can continue to be faithful soul winners and reach in the lost. I pray that you'll continue to, to work in our families. Um, our, our families are very important to us in this church, and so we do ask uh, for your guidance and your provision. Help our men be men, and help our uh, wives be wonderful wives, and uh, just pray that everything that's said and done in this church and this congregation honors you and glorifies you in Jesus' name. Amen.